Hey guys, welcome. I'm uh, waiting on some stragglers here, but thank you guys for joining us this morning. Aaron's like, you gotta cut songs, we don't have enough time. I'm gonna be talking for so long this morning. Huh? Oh, thank you. Oof, man. That's not a punch in the gut. <laughs> he says, we were over there praying. We had a rocky practice this morning, so. Will you guys please stand and join us, please? Uh, we're gonna center and, and start this, this morning off worshiping together. All right. Together for how good you are loving. You give us more than we deserve. You are unfailing. And we are more than conquerors. Savior, in you our future is secure. By your power, we will not be shaken. We will not be silent.
glad you are here. Uh, my name is Sarah. I serve on the staff here at Element. I get the opportunity of welcoming you into service, letting you know a little bit more about who we are and what we believe in, as well as what to expect while you're here today, um, and some upcoming events or other news that we just think you and your family should know about. But before all that, I'd love to extend a special welcome to anybody. Sorry, my shoes are tall this morning. I feel like I'm le leaning down too far. Okay. A uh, special welcome to anyone who might be joining us for one of the very first times this morning. We'd love a chance to connect with you and know that you are here, answer any questions that you might have. Uh, behind the seat backs in front of you, you'll see two cards. There's one that says welcome. You can take that home, read it over when you have a little bit more time. It goes more into uh, what we believe in, why we do some of the things that we do specifically on Sunday mornings. And then the other one says connect with us. You can fill that out with your information so that we can get in touch with you throughout the week, um, or you can use it as a sign up as well as letting us know about any prayer requests that you have. Once you fill that out, you can either drop it in any of the boxes by the side doors on your way out, or if you go through those back double doors after service, I will be at our welcome center. Would love to receive that from you, answer any questions that you might have. For those of us, those of us, those of you who are joining us on our live stream, a very special welcome to you as well. We'd love a chance to know that you're with us and you can do that by simply typing hello into the chat area. The biggest thing to know about us here at Element is that we love Jesus. Our hope is that when you think of the people of Element, you think of a group of people who love Jesus and strive to connect more people to him. We aim to glorify God by teaching and living out the scriptures, transforming community into gospel community and planting churches. Okay, first things first, I wanted to extend a huge thank you to our eFamilies team and all of the volunteers that made CTV this week such a success. Uh, we know that it was no small feat just on the eFamilies e team themselves, but also we had people cooking barbecues, teaching how to do crafts, and when I'm in your class, that's like extra credit to do that, but we wanted to share with you a little bit from the week and just how much fun it was. Uh, CTV is an evening family event where uh, our younger kids as well as their parents got to come have a night to just hang out, bond, connect, also learn more about Jesus, get silly, sing songs together, do crafts, and really just build community together. So uh, if you were able to help out or participate, we hope that you enjoyed it as much as we did. Okay. 
Switching gears a bit, um, registration is now open for our next Financial Peace University. If you are unfamiliar with FPU, as most people call it, it is a course that strives to help its participants to build better relationships with money and get out from under the mountains of debt our culture says you need to live in. Uh, Last year's class at Element, participants paid off a collective of $29,326.70 uh, in non-mortgage debt, which is pretty stinking incredible if you saw what the class size of last year's class was. Um, in addition to that, they paid off, closed out, cut up up to six credit cards, and they put an extra $7,000 into their savings accounts. So if you're ready to take control of your finances instead of letting them control you, sign up today. Lastly, we wanted to remind you that with it being summer and so many vacations and things and camps and all of those types of things happening, we are always looking for extra help, even on a substitute basis or just to fill in for the summer. So if you have some free time this summer and you're willing to help either in our kids' classrooms or um, setting up coffee before service, cleaning up after service, helping out with communion, Thank you to the five people who noticed it wasn't out and helped me get that out there this morning quickly. Uh, we are always looking for extra help and appreciate any that we can get. You can talk to me after service. And those are all the announcements that I have for you this morning. So now if you'll please stand and say hello to the people around you. I was looking at the Financial Peace University slide they had up, and I'm thinking, never worry about money again. That is a very high bar. I mean, I did Financial Peace University. I still worry about money sometimes. So I, I don't know. That might be over-promising. But it's still a great class, so you should come check it out. I do have one announcement for you, and that is the first Friday in August, which is August 2nd, we are doing our one and only uh, trivia night for this year. And so you want to put that on your calendars, find some other people to get in the team with. If you think you're really smart, you can come by yourself, but you're going to feel really dumb at the end. <laughs> Not saying you are, I'm just saying you are. No. Um, <laughs> Now, uh, uh, get some people together, come up with a team. If you need child care, we are doing child care that night. You can sign up for child care. We need to know how many ahead of time. So what we do is we open the doors at 5. The food trucks are just about ready, hopefully, to serve. We've gone through a couple hiccups in the past. We've 
They know what to do now. It doesn't mean they always do it. But anyway, we want to start uh, taking orders, serving food about 5.30. We'll do a kids round at 5.30, and the adult round will start at 6. So if you get off at work at like 5 or 5.30, you have plenty of time to make it. But I would encourage you, make a team with some friends, your gospel community, or just somebody random, rando walking down the street. Hey, come with me to trivia. You're going to be on my team. I don't know anything. Neither do I. Great. It's a great low bar activity. The questions aren't like Bible questions. No one's getting up front. We're like, so what do you know about George Washington? Did he really cut down a cherry tree? It's like, I don't know. It's, you're not like the guy, uh, I'm, I am just rambling right now. But you're not, you're not like the guy in Monty Python, Search for the Holy Grail, where it's like, red, no blue, and you fly off the bridge. <laughs> the three of you that get it. Sign up for trivia. It's going to be a great time. I'm going to shut up now. Welcome to Element if you're new. Uh, actually, I'm not going to shut up. I'm going to preach a sermon now. <laughs> Welcome to Element if you're new. There are Bibles in the seat backs in front of you. If you don't own one, you can have one. If you forgot one, you can use one. There are the sermon notes on the communion tables around the room. And if you get those on the front side, you're going to get the verses that we will cover this morning. Underneath that, you get a question and a place to write down your questions if you have one. You can always send your questions to questions at ourelement.org. On the inside, you're going to get a short recap of what we'll talk about. On the back side, you get a place to write down your notes. If you have a smart device, you can download an app. It is simple. It's something called Uversion. Once you download it, it just says Bible. Click on More and then Events in Uversion. We will come up by GPS in your smart device and you will get sermon notes, verses, questions, announcements, all that goes with today's message. My name is Aaron. I'm one of the pastors at Element. I want you to stand with me for the reading of God's Word. This is Ephesians <laughs> chapter 6, verse 13, and it says, Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Let's pray. Father, this morning, we ask that you would move us to a place of understanding what this armor is, how to live in it, how it looks when we wear it, and how then we would live out in this world in ways that glorify who you are, walking in your strength and your provision that has first been given to us so that we would glorify you in all that we do. Amen. Have a seat. We are going through the New Testament book of Ephesians. This is week 23, and we have one week left after this week, and you will be done with this book. Now, last week, if you were here or weren't here, we talked about the spiritual realm and some things in our world that people want to ignore or think you're a weirdo on the other end if you believe them. But I think not believing in them takes just as much faith as believing in them. If you look at the world around us, you're like, something is going on here. And so what Christianity believes, though, is different from what old pagan religions believe. Old pagan religions, they saw spiritual forces behind every tree. Like in older areas, if, eras, if you had a problem, then you made some spirit angry. So you had to sacrifice to the water god, the, the tree god, the harvest god, the jack-in-the-box head, whatever it is. You had to go and, and you had to go sacrifice so that it would no longer be angry at you. And in that sense, they saw everything in the world as being a spiritual problem. Now you fast forward to the late 20th century, you know, 21st century now, and you have these people called biological determinists. And biological determinists will say that everything is just period in your genes. That's all that it is. You're biologically determined. That's why you do what we do. You also have as existential humanist psychologists who say, no, no, it's all a matter of your personal choices. Your personal choices make you what you are. And when you walk into this today, you got it so confused. What is it? Is it, is it me? Is it the world? Is it my flesh? Is it the devil? What, what is it? And if you build on what we talked about last week, Paul gives this analogy called the full armor of God. And Paul, the Bible, show that evil is multidimensional. I think when you look at how the Bible actually speaks about stuff like this, Christianity is the most nuanced, multidimensional view of evil possible because there is evil inside of me. There is evil outside of me. And we live our lives in this place. So we have to know how to address all of these things. And this is why Paul talks about what he does. And so when he talks about the full armor of God, he's really kind of saying, unless you know how it's coming and what's coming at your life, well, you might be defeated. 
And so Paul says evil, again, is multidimensional. We have to know how to deal with it. It's kind of like this. We don't luck ourselves into a quote-unquote happy life. You put on the full armor of God, which relates to the gospel. It's really putting on the gospel in every part of your life. And so to put on the full armor of God, trusting in God, walking with him, leads to just simple practical things of following God. So we follow through. We obey what he says. There is a consistency that comes about in our walk with Jesus. And one of the things our world hates today is to hear that word obey, especially when it comes to God. Like God said something, I'm going to obey that. It's like, oh, we get so freaked out about that. But part of what obedience means is we actually put on that armor of God. We understand the gospel. We begin to walk in this grace and this hope and this goodness. And it's sad because we want God to come into our lives and empower us. Many people will say this, but this idea of submitting to God in the midst of that this is something we don't really want to hear because we're selfish. And this is why Paul, before he gets to this, he talks about how we live in this place called submission. And I told you this word submission is a military term, but it's also a voluntary word. And submission means that we want to strengthen one another as we strengthen one another and submit ourselves to each other. We become strengthened in the midst of that. So it's this military idea. One commentator said this, to put on the full armor of God means you're in the army now. You get an order, you take the order, and if you don't obey the order, it probably means disaster. Now, not just disaster for you, but for the people around you, this body of Christ that we call the church. And so the Bible and really common sense says a whole lot of practical things in this. Like if you are going to get married, marry somebody who has the same spiritual commitment that you do. Like if you're a Christian, you desire to grow in Christ, Marry someone who understands that. Don't marry somebody who says, well, you have your religion and I have mine. We're going to be fine. Because typically I will tell you, they're not fine. <laughs> You're not fine. If you have believe in a biblical sexual ethic, meaning sex is something God invented to be used in the context of a total commitment, you marry someone who thinks that too. Like the Bible says, sex was built as a way to say to somebody else, I belong completely and permanently and exclusively to you. And this is many what times that God calls us to, and so many people want to rebel against that. And we say, I'll obey if I get an explanation, and not just get an explanation, if I like the explanation, th then I'll obey. But what if God doesn't give you an explanation, and God says, I made you, I just want you to trust me in this. And that's many times where we have to come down to. So again, Paul uses a military metaphor, but Paul does not glory in warfare. He's trying to say, this is the only metaphor that gets across the seriousness of what it means to submit and serve and live with one another as believers. So the first thing is, Paul again says, put on the armor of God. Now the armor, as I've said, it is a symbol. It's a metaphor of the benefits and privileges of the gospel, truth, righteousness, salvation. We put on these privileges and benefits and begin to use them in our lives and it starts to create a new disposition for us, a new way of thinking about ourselves and the people around us. So as we do this, you also want to put on the armor before the battle, like not during the battle. Like we just want to get up every day and start to live in these things. Uh, it says, therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. Tim Keller wrote this. He says, when the arrows are flying and other warriors have broken through the breach and are hurling their broadswords and spears, that's not the time to say, excuse me, while I slip into something more appropriate. It's too late. Right? So every day we want to get up and begin to live in the gospel as good news over our lives. Not when you're at work and that knucklehead does something dumb and you're like, ah, now I need it. Now I need it. Serenity now. Like, now I, before when you get up in the morning, this armor is God's armor. It's like Jesus is the general in the metaphor, so we follow. And each of these pieces of armor that Paul will talk about is a way of applying the gospel to our lives. The same gospel that Paul has been preaching for the last six chapters of the book of Ephesians. And so he says, basically, cover every part of your life with the gospel. If you have a Bible, open to Ephesians chapter 6. If you're going to use one of the ones in the seat back in front of you, that is on page 636. If you've been following along, you can actually get to flip the page today. 636. Uh, there is this thing called LARPing. Have you heard about live action role play where kids and a lot of adults uh, dress up with like armor and fake swords and I'm the wizard and they throw like glitter and do all these crazy things. Well, these verses are really like a Christian LARPer's dream. I, I don't know what they're doing in kids' classes today, but if they came out with like 
cardboard swords. I, I don't know. It, it'd just be funny. Anyway, Ephesians 6, 13. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. So first off, we have to know where we are weak in our lives because we sometimes are so convinced that we are so strong, but we're not. We are weak. We are sinful. The ever only way we could ever be good enough to stand before a good and holy God is when he lays his righteousness upon us as a gift. And so this good news, this gospel is offered freely to everyone, but the bad news is a lot of people don't live in it or even receive it because they think they're strong enough. I'm strong enough in my own sense of righteousness. I'm good enough. Like they know they're not perfect, but they're definitely better than that guy, right? You can always find somebody who's worse than you are, and that sense of strength many times keeps us from receiving the gift that God offers to us. Understanding our weaknesses is going to lead us to actually begin to live in God's strength. Are you worried about your family? If you have kids, your kids turning out right, about your marriage or your friendships or your dating life, do you feel weak in any of that? Congratulations, you are in a spot where you're eligible for God's strength. Do you have a decision in front of you that you just don't know what to do? Well, you trust in God with all your heart. You trust in His strength. Does this thing love, serve, for honor, glorify who God is? Walk into that. I, in the sense that Paul talks about, we can't be strong in ourselves and strong in God in the same time. It's only where we find our weakness and we lay that in front of Him that we become strong. One writer said this, Jesus didn't go around pulling rabbits out of hats or catching bullets in his teeth. All of Jesus' miracles started with a problem. So if you show up today and you're like, I have got a problem. Good news. Good news. You're ready for a miracle right there. You know, bad news, you know, no problems. Eh, well, whatever. Somebody else will give you their problems. I guarantee you that'll happen. They'll dump those on you. We got to know where we are weak. So here's the question as we start. Where do you feel weakest right now? Just think of that place in your life. That is an invitation to trust God right there in the midst of that weakness. You don't have to have it all together. It's not all about you. We step in in our weakness. Looking to ourselves for strength is going to lead us to find it in short supply. God is not your co-pilot. He is the pilot of this whole thing. And those who stand in Christ have this confidence in the gospel that is deep. And it's like a well of water that never runs dry. So here we go. Verse 14, number one, stand firm with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. And I'm going to read these out of the NIV. I think it translates better to our ears. So the first way you stand firm is in the truth. In the truth. One of the reasons why I think the church and Christians end up being a mess and how we reach the world is we have this temptation to see people around us as our enemies rather than people who need to be pursued with the truth of the gospel. Paul has said that the enemy doesn't work and play people in, in these really scary ways. The way he plays us, like a puppeteer behind the curtain, is he puts sin right in front of us. He tempts us, and we run after that. Now, people are, are not innocent victims. Victims. We all make our own decisions. We're morally culpable. Again, but the enemy tempts. Who sins? We do. Satan lies. Who believes the lies? We do. Satan accuses us of things, but who believes those untrue things? We believe it. Satan does not force anybody to do anything. You know, the old skit, like, devil made me do it. Devil didn't make you do anything. You did it many times because you already wanted to. See, you did it. Our king, he is great and loving and good and redeeming, and he loves us and wants to live with him. But many times, his kids love anything but him. We serve anything but who he is. We serve nothing but death and sorrow, and that should make us sad. And so we have to see our war is not against people, though today in our world, it feels like it. Every one is always so angry at everybody else. What we want to do is stand against the evil behind that. Apart from God's grace, we're like everyone else in the world. We were also enemies of God. And God brought us in to be his children. That doesn't make us better. It makes us, hey, we've been saved. We've been redeemed. And the truth is life is hard. Jesus didn't walk through life unscathed at all. This means if you are single and you decide, I'm going to live a life right now as a single, life's going to be hard. Singleness is hard in our world. Say no to sin and yes to Jesus. If you're married, being married is going to be hard in our world because you married a weirdo. <laughs> and they, and you're a weirdo. And you married each other. And you got like this just conglomeration of weirdness going on. Loving your kids is going to be hard in our world because they're turning out just like you. Everything you're like, oh, my kids, that's just like you. Loving your parents is going to be hard because you're turning out just like them. No, I'm not. 
Yes, you are. Yes, you are. I mean, working a job, paying bills, loving friends is going to be hard. And when hard days come, you stand in the truth. That's what Paul is saying. The truth that God has revealed. You throw off the lie. You stand there. If you disbelieve the lie, you stand there. Continue to disbelieve the lie. If you learn to love others, you stand there and continue to love others even when it's hard. One of the ways the enemy works is through lies. Paul has been saying this. Jesus says this. In John chapter 8, Jesus says, Satan's the father of lies. You speak English. You've been doing it for years. I've been doing it for years. And I still mumble and talk too fast. And he's been lying since the very beginning. The very beginning of time. What is your defense against somebody who knows how to lie so well? It's to know the truth. That's what it is. What's the truth? Jesus, word of God, right there. John 17, 17, Jesus prays for us, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. John 1, 14 says, Jesus came full of grace and truth. You want the truth? You can handle the truth. My wife and I will be married 32 years this year. Lots of ups and downs, uh, but we have been faithful to one another. I love her with all that I am, but what if she didn't believe that I loved her or she believed I wasn't faithful to her? Would that affect our relationship? Would that lie affect how we interact? Of course it would. Of course it would. In order to kill you, the enemy just needs you to believe something untrue. He lies, and the believing a lie is going to destroy you. It's why he loves gossip. We just talk about one another and all these untrue things. He loves it if you're mad at somebody and won't go and talk to them to get to the truth. He loves bitterness because that's the way that lies get disseminated. You go to the big Ten Commandments, Exodus 20, verse 16. Don't lie. Don't, it's right there. Lying's evil. It's not meant to be part of our life. It's opposed to God's kingdom. Here's another thing. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. We all have things in our lives that we wish we didn't do. Something we said or didn't say. Something we did or we didn't do. We find it so hard to believe the gospel. Guys, look, you trust in Christ, you are forgiven, you are purified, you are righteous, and the enemy keeps whispering to you, God can't renew you. God can't redeem that. And so God's people struggle to live in and receive the grace that God gives because we so often believe the lie. The old movie, Liar, Liar, it's a comedy when one guy tells the truth. (laughs) It's funny. Paul is saying the only way you escape from the deception of the enemy is you let the word of God interpret reality for you, what God has said. Number two, verse 14, with the breastplate of righteousness in place. So righteousness refers to a rightness in relationship with God. Our lives become centered upon him. We get our eyes off of Jesus so like squirrel and we're running off another direction. I told you last week when we talked about spiritual warfare that we should not get caught up in all of the hype. You may say, I haven't seen anybody with Rosemary's baby or I haven't seen green puke and people's heads spinning around and green goo like the exorcist. I'm trying to tell you that's not how the enemy works. The enemy works through good old fashioned sin. 1 John 2.16 calls it the cravings of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boasting of life. It's, I think I'm pretty good. All these things are what modern advertising runs after. If it looks good, feels good, like it, love it, gotta have it, I need that thing, I want it. The devil doesn't show up with a pitchfork in one hand and Rosemary's baby in the other because you'd run away from that. You'd be like, ah, unless you think that's really cool, then he might show up like that, but you'd run away from that. Our righteousness is a gift of God. It is laid upon us like new clothes where we want to say no to sin and yes to Jesus. Here's an exercise for you. Are you willing to admit in your life what your favorite sins even are? Are you willing to? It's like, oh, oh no, th- this isn't really that bad. We hate admitting any of those things in our lives because we don't want to admit that we're bad or evil or anything like that. It's unrighteousness where we love our flesh more than we love our God. God has laid righteousness upon us as a gift. It's not something we earn. It is something that is given. Number three, verse 15, and your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. So feet and gospel meant to go together. It talks about this urgency. Most of our spiritual lives today are not about urgency. It's about how do I get to be comfortable? How do I get to live in this thing where I feel good? And then we have a little bit of apathy, no urgency. Listen to how Charles Spurgeon talks about the gospel. He says, we believe in a gospel that was formed in the purpose of God from all eternity. 
integrity, designed with infinite wisdom, wrought out at an enormous expense, costing nothing less than the blood of Jesus, brought home by the infinite power of the Holy Spirit, a gospel full of blessings, any one of which would outweigh the world in price, a gospel as free as it is full, a gospel everlasting and immutable, a gospel of which we can never think too much of, whose praises we can never exaggerate. And if that is how you see the gospel, you're going to have a readiness to want to go out and begin to talk about that. You understand God's purposes in the world. You want to see them done. That God has pronounced peace to people in the world who want to fight and destroy one another. God has pronounced peace peace. He has paid for the sins of the people in the world. There are over a billion Muslims that think if they observe the five pillars of Islam, if you watch the news in the last week, it's like 900, over a thousand of them died making this pilgrimage to Mecca to go to the Hajj. And this is like one of the five pillars of Islam. You have to do this at one time in your life. If you follow them, he'll hardly think, well, Allah is then going to take me to heaven. But not really, because there's this line in, this, in the Hadith that almost every Muslim knows, that on the last day, you then have to carry your burden of sin across a tightrope. And the more sin you have, the more you're likely to fall off into hell. You've got to carry your own sins. And all of it is works, all of it's legalism, and someone has to tell them the gospel. Jesus took our sins and our sorrows. He made them his very own. He bore my burden to Calvary. He suffered and died alone. How marvelous, how wonderful my song will ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful that my Savior died for me. This is the gospel. You have millions and millions of Buddhists and Hindus who think every cycle of life, they come back with karma and they got to pay off the sins of the previous life, but you're never going to be done because now you got the sins of this life too that you now have to pay off over and over and over. Somebody has to tell them there was one who already lived the perfect life, who died death for you in your place. We need them to understand that. We need to understand the gospel, that God has done a work. And our feet are ready to go and to speak about this, looking for opportunities. Gospel, this peace, cost Jesus' his life, and it's urgent. All right, number four, verse 16. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. In Paul's day, shields are made of wood, and so if someone has a wooden shield, what you want to do is light an arrow on fire and shoot it into the shield because genius move. We're going to burn that shield down to nothing. And so what they would then do is they would wrap their shields in leather dipped in water. Genius idea. And Paul's point is the enemy is constantly lobbing flaming arrows at you. In Revelation 12, Zechariah 3, we're told that he accuses us. He says, you're not loved, you're not forgiven, you're not cared for, you're not significant, you're not doing enough, you're not maturing fast enough in this faith you say that you have. And then people get all confused and they start trying to accomplish things that Jesus has already accomplished. It's, we, it's crazy. How do you protect yourself? Faith. You trust in the gospel, what God has said. And when our enemy or our own hearts accuse us, that's when you desperately need to trust what God has said. Accusation is like fire falling from the sky. And too often when these accusations come, you're right, I'm not good enough. Oh, I'm terrible. Oh, I can't believe this. People drop their shields and then they start to run completely exposed. When the war starts, the worst thing you can do is drop your shield and run from Jesus. You need to run towards him. How are lies extinguished? By the truth. That's how Paul starts. Faith in God as revealed in the gospel. In Ephesians, Paul talks about the length, the height, the breadth of God's love. This is the confidence that extinguishes every dart the enemy wants to throw at you. Here's the question, right? Where are you most likely not to believe what God has said? Where are you most likely to not believe in his forgiveness of your past or his provision over your future? Now, here's a little side note about gospel communities. Roman soldiers used to have this tactic when they're barraged by fiery arrows. They would huddle up together so they can make a circle and a top on them. It's like, uh, you got one like this, boom, you can get one from the side. You huddle up together around one another. You can protect one another. So my faith helps you. Yours helps me. Number five, verse 17, take the helmet of salvation. And this is like your brain, your knowledge, what God has said, okay? The helmet of salvation. Let me say something very obvious and practical. You need your head. 
Pretty simple, right? I know people who have lost fingers and limbs and they can still teach shop class. But I've, but I've never seen anybody lose their head and keep going. Zombie movies, what do you go for? The head, the head. It's why we wear helmets. I used to snowboard, went off a jump, landed on my head. I was dizzy and sick the rest of the day, wore a helmet ever since then. Wakeboarding, you think water's not that hard? It's pretty hard. I rung my bell, 15 minutes. I did not even know I was at the lake. I'm like, where am I? What is happening right now? I'm in the boat just like sick. I wear a helmet every time I wakeboard now. You go to a construction area, what do they make you do? Hard hat, hard hat. you put on a helmet. Because you've got to protect your head. You go to boot camp, they don't say, oh, when the battle starts, keep your head high and your helmet off, unless they don't like you. Then, then they'll tell you that, right? If you have not trusted Jesus in your life, you are walking through this world, through battle, with your head up and no helmet. And you're probably wondering why you keep getting blows to the head. Look, i got to tell you, Paul says, without Jesus, you're dead. He is your defense. He is your hope. Death is real. Just like Satan, demons, hell, we need Jesus. And when we are saved, you let that knowledge of that salvation dominate the way that we begin to think about everything. We see all of life through the lens of the gospel. Number six, verse 17, and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Ooh, well, now you get a weapon that's kind of for offense, but not to go out and like stab people with it, right? It's there to, as you take on the enemy. This Paul refers to as the scriptures, the Bible. Now, does Satan use that sword? Oh, yeah, 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 he does. Starts in Genesis 3, he says to the woman, did God really say? Sounds like a lot of bad pastors today and a lot of bad churches. Did God really mean this when he said that? Yes, God meant what he said. Satan tries the same tactics with Jesus. Matthew chapter 4, pulls out the sword, goes, misquotes it, goes after Jesus. What does Jesus do? Pulls out the sword, quotes Deuteronomy, whack. I mean, think about that. If, if our lives rested on quoting Deuteronomy, we would all be dead. Okay? <laughs> we would just all be dead. Christians who don't know they're in a battle never pick up this sword because they think they're in peacetime. Listen, you need your sword. Jesus said it. Paul, we need our swords. Let me give you two dumb things that people do with the Bible. The first one is we stab each other with it. We're always running around stabbing each other with it. I've seen it over things like the second coming of Christ. Who is the true Israel? Is it, is it us? Is it charismatic gifts? Reaching culture. The enemy loves that. It's great to watch the enemy army kill each other. Now, there are close-handed issues, which we should go to death over. I mean, with Jesus is God. Salvation is death. The gospel is what we... But over here, open-handed issues, what we want to do, we can argue, we can debate, it can be fine, but it's a way to sharpen our swords, not stab each other. The other thing people like to do is talk about the sword, but never use it. Right? Oh, I heard in the Bible somewhere it might say something like this, and a lot of times that's not even in, in the Bible. God helps those, who, helps those who help themselves. Thank you, Benjamin Franklin. No, no, it's not in the Bible at all, right? I, I actually have a sword at home, and a real one, and I've been waiting for someone to break in so I could use it, and I've never been able to. I know I'm a terrible person, but that's one of the reasons. I just, anyway, <laughs> the enemy is going to try to convince you because he lies that your sword is not a sword. He's going to say, you don't need to read that Bible. Put it down. That's not a sword. It's a book that causes division. Oh, there's so much hate in there. Oh, it's, if, you, if you look at what it says about this thing over here, well, you know, that's just not up with the times. You shouldn't read it, and so you put it down. And then the enemy picks it up, and he stabs you with it. And you say, hey, I thought you said it wasn't a sword. And he says, it is. I lied. If you read it, you wouldn't know that I do that. It's in there. It's in there. The enemy tries to get that sword out of your hands. It's why there are cults. It is why there are self-righteous Christians. It is why there's movements today inside quote-unquote Christianity who have no idea what the gospel even is. And it causes us to see anything but the real enemy as the enemy. The enemy uses a sword against us. So you need the scriptures desperately. They are important for life. The enemy is trying to destroy all that God has deemed good. Family, friendships, worship, hope, grace, faith. This sword is able to cut sin and blame out of our lives. It's meant to come in and help us to see our own unrighteousness and see what God has called us to in His grace so we're not undone by the places that we failed. It is where we get to see I can come back into God's grace and His goodness. Here's a hard question I once heard somebody ask. Would you ever take your kids to a doctor who studied the human body as lazily as you study the Word of God? Ouch. 
Hard question, right? Would you ever take your kids to a doctor who studied the human body as lazily as you study the Word of God? I do not say that to shame you in any way whatsoever. What I want to say is that we should be reading it and looking at it and seeing what God says. Again, another reason to be in a gospel community, we want to help one another to apply these words and how they affect real life situations. A lot of times that's in how we can bug one another, but hey, still like that. And then number seven, verse 18, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert, which means pay attention to, have your eyes open, and always keep on praying for all the saints. So we pray for each other. Why? Because the enemy is trying to take our heads off. The enemy longs to lead people into sin, destroy relationships, destroy marriage, corrupt with lies. And so we pray because people need it. If you don't know how to pray, here's your first prayer. God, teach me how to pray. God, teach me how to spend time with you. I'm just going to start talking to you and teach me how to listen to you in the midst of that. And Paul says you pray with this distinction, in the Spirit. Now, that does not mean you pray in some trance. Paul already told us what filled with the Spirit means. Ephesians 3, 17 says, when you're filled with the knowledge of the love of God. So you go back to the gospel, what God has said, all of these things. Prayer in the Spirit is full of confidence in God's strength and His power and His love. You don't have to be afraid to ask God for things because we all need to ask God for things. But we don't just pray to ask God for things. Sometimes when you hear people talk about prayer, it's when they say, oh, well, I prayed and this didn't happen, so therefore prayer doesn't work. Prayer is not about trying to get stuff from God. We bring our requests, but prayer is about deepening our relationship with Him as we walk with Him day by day. And really, prayer is this place where we, in the end, most exemplify being strong in the Lord rather than strong in ourselves. One commentator I was reading says he believes that prayerlessness is proof either of extreme arrogance, like I don't need God, or unbelief, I don't really think you will help. Paul Miller wrote a book called A Pray in Life, and he said this, If you are not praying, then you are quietly confident that time, money, and talent are all you need in life. And it's not all we need in life. It's not. Those who are strong in the Lord and not themselves find themselves praying. Paul says, all places, all times, just instinctively. I was, I was driving down the road the other day, and something happened, and I, was, and I was like, oh, and I just started talking to God about it, but I realized... I was already talking to God about something else. I'm like, oh, wow, that's weird. You know, it's, but it was cool. I didn't even realize I did it. I was just talking to myself. I'm talking to God. Okay, anyway, so <laughs> let me wrap this up. We have to let the gospel dominate our thinking. Like we, we put it on every morning. So here's the gospel if you don't know. We have sold ourselves into sin. We rightfully and are eternally condemned because of it. But because God loves us, Jesus did for us what we could not do for ourselves. He comes to earth. He takes the consequences for our sin by dying on a cross in our place. And now he offers healing, forgiveness, and salvation to all who simply receive it as a gift. It is not something you earn. It is not something you have to do the five pillars to get to. It is something that God lays upon you as a gift by simply trusting in Christ. And if you have not done so, after this entire book of Ephesians, you can trust Christ today. You can put on the full armor of God. And this armor, again, is something that God takes and he lays it upon us as a gift. It is given to us. This is really the beauty of what God continues to do as he draws us to himself. One of the reasons every week at Element we come to the place of communion, it's a reminder of this is part of the reminder of putting on the full armor of God, of trusting him in each and every part of our life. That's why you break a cracker like Christ's body was broken for us. You dip it in the wine of the grape juice as a reminder of his blood that was shed because he is the one who brings salvation, gives salvation to us. And this is where we lay our lives down, and we remember that. And if you have been struggling, or maybe some of those lies, you're not good enough, you don't have it together enough, I can't believe you did this thing, you're not loved, this is the place where you lay all that down and realize, no, Christ did the work for me. And then as we trust in the gospel, the good news, our lives begin to be lived differently. They actually start to look different because we love Christ more than we love ourselves. And this is what we want to remember. And so today, we don't pass communion throughout the room. You actually have to get up and take communion. But we invite you to that every single week. Because Jesus says when you get together, do this in remembrance of what I did, of me. 
If you need prayer today, maybe you are going through life and you feel like you're just getting blow after fiery dart to your head all the time. And you're like, well, I just need, I need some prayer as I walk through this to believe the things that God has said, to trust the good news of the gospel. Not that everything in my life is going to be easy. Not that everything is going to work out the way I want, but that God walks with me through every little bit of it. And if you want someone to pray with you right across the way in the lounge, you can go during service, you can go after service. I'd love to pray with you. If you have questions about today, you can grab them and ask them. If they don't know, they'll come and grab me. If I don't know, I'll go look it up. Okay. <laughs> but we'll answer the questions that you might even have in the midst of all this because we want to be a people who trust what Christ has done. If you'd like to give, there's offering boxes on the side wall. In the back, you can give online, but Element does not pass an offering plate because we believe that our giving is meant to be in response to what God has done. It is natural to begin to do that. And so rather than something sit in front of you, you've got to actually think about it. And then you have to go and do that. And so that's why we have giving the way that we do. But it's still part of our worship. And I encourage you maybe to grab those sermon notes, take some questions, walk and talk with other people this week. Take some of those questions that we ask in that and start thinking about what sins do I think aren't really that bad? You know, what places am I where I think I'm going to disbelieve God in this because I want to have this thing over here? Just start to walk through those honestly. Because if we're not dealing with them honestly, we're going to keep shoving those things down. We want to see everything that we're trying to hide and begin to walk through that in ways that honor who Christ is in every bit of our lives. And we do that together. So take some of those questions and begin to maybe do that with some other people. Begin to walk in this full armor of God because it's been laid upon you. It's not something you earn. It is something that is given. And there is great grace in trusting what God has done for us. Let's pray. Father, this morning, we ask that you would move us into a deeper understanding of your goodness that has been given to us as a gift, that we would understand the gospel, the greatness of what it means that what you came and and the cost that you paid to bring us to yourself. And that it would so infuse us with this joy and this hope that we would want to share it with everybody, not just with our words, though with our words, but with our lives. That we would reflect who you are in all things. This gospel that is good and full and free. But it's not cheap because it costs you your life. So I ask that we would trust in your provision, that our eyes would move off of ourselves and on to you. That we would give ourselves to you completely and fully. And every time the enemy pops up with a lie or our own hearts start to accuse us with lies, we would in turn trust you. We would look to what you have said. And we would say, how marvelous and wonderful is my Savior's love for me that you have deemed to love us and bring us home. So teach us to live in a deeper understanding of the good news of the gospel. And we ask this in your son's good name. Amen. So as we drop these curtains, my question for you is something that I started with at the very beginning. I want you to take a moment and just start to think through Where in your life right now do you feel weakest? Where in your life right now are you like, man, I just just don't know about this. I don't know if I have the strength in this. Whether it's a restoration of a relationship, whether it's something at your job or your home or something that's just coming up on the horizon, whatever, where do you feel weakest? Because that right there is an invitation to trust the strength of God. Because we don't have it all together. We don't have what it takes. But Jesus promises to walk with us through that. And it may not turn out the way that you're hoping. But in the end, it will ultimately bring bring glory to God. And it will bring goodness to his people. So we trust him in that. So God, you know, show me where I'm weakest right now. Teach me to trust you in that. I will trust your strength. And then come and take communion. Sings these songs with us. And let's be a people who begin to walk through this week. When you wake up in the morning, full armor of God, put it on, head out into the day. Don't wait until the battle rages around you 
and you just want to rip somebody's head off. I'll show you the armor of God. I got a sword. You know, where, where we start in this place of understanding our own great salvation, that we would then be those who are God's ambassadors in this world. Your heart in 
every burning star a signal fire of grace. If creation sings your praises so
gift that you've given us of, of salvation, I, um, I pray that we would remain aware of just the magnitude of the gospel and that as we go through life, we, uh, we wouldn't be just stumbling through blind, that we would be, um, we would be ready to, to obey we would be ready to be in the uh, in the the spiritual warfare. I, I pray that every one of us would be um, 
would develop a, a, a deeper relationship with you where we, um, where we follow you and we lean on you for strength, but we, we don't um, just kind of haphazardly stumble through life. And uh, again, we, we just, we thank you and we praise you. In your name, amen. Can you guys stand and sing with me? We're going to sing one more song together.
you guys so much for joining us this morning. Jesus loves you.